Yes, we are good to go. Here we go. It's Wednesday afternoon, early evening for you, Pradeep, right? It's it's 9 p.m. in the night in Sydney. Oh, my gosh. Okay, already. <laughs> but do you know that um, I, I thought this is uh, 6 p.m. Australia time because I've got another uh, session conference that I'm speaking at another one hour time. Yes, <laughs> you are so busy, man. Um, for, for those of you who are watching and... This session is going to be talking all about building partnership consortiums, and there's no better speaker in the planet who I could find to speak on this subject. Pradeep Khanna, he's the executive director of the APAC Asia and Sydney chapter of the BRAR Association and one of my personal mentors. So Pradeep, welcome. Thank you so much, Casey. I am absolutely delighted. You know, I love Casey's energy levels. And that's one of the reasons that I'm here. And let me say a very good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night to all of you, whatever part of the world you are. Back to you, Casey. <laughs> Awesome. So let's jump into maybe you can share a little bit uh, to the people that are watching now, um, more of your background just to to give them a more full understanding of where you're coming from. Okay, so folks, uh, look, I think uh, I did my bachelor's in technology uh, many, many years back, where possibly a lot of you were not even born. <laughs> so that was way back in 1977. And, you know, if somebody still remembers how to calculate, I'm 66 years old. I did it from Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi. It's one of the premier institutes uh, worldwide. 1991, I migrated to Australia. 21 year, 25 years back, I was a senior executive with Australian Trade Commission looking after international business, so World Bank, ADB projects, Southeast Asia, and other likes. Much later in my career, I was with IBM, and I've had a few global roles. In fact, when Lenovo was born, and it was divested out of IBM, I was the Asia-Pacific Deployment, Man Deployment Planning Manager for the diversion. Uh, well, in short, I've built up a multi-billion dollar business for IBM, Australia, New Zealand, leveraging India, China, Philippines, Vietnam, Egypt, Romania, Argentina, Brazil. At the moment, I'm very, very heavily immersed into, into what should I say? VR, Meta, <laughs> XR, well, all of these. And apart from what Casey mentioned in terms of my roles with VRARA, I'm also involved with IEEE, in getting the debate between open source and proprietary technology and, and to push for standards. And from global mindset perspective, we are working to create a marketplace in VR area. And why? Because I get invited to speak to so many conferences. And when I speak at these conferences, I find 70% people do not even understand the difference between VR and AR. So we see an asymmetrical market at the moment. We see an imperfect market, but hey, this is where the opportunity is because we are heading for the tipping point in the next two to three years. And then I'm an adjunct professor at a number of places in Australia, Asia. I'm also an advisory board of companies and, and, and it just goes on. So, but needless to say that I am very, very immersed into immersive technologies and seldom come down to the real reality. So back to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, it, you know, I, I, I was like looking on Twitter yesterday and somebody made a tweet like for anybody that is in immersive technology, you know, whether that's AR, VR, XR, metaverse, he said, take notes because this is the most amazing time to be in this industry. So, you know. And I, I personally couldn't agree more with it, you see, because while the technologies have been around for last 25 plus years, and I used to think, you know, that uh, 5G has been the game changer. And, you know, we will see, uh, you know, when 5G takes about seven to eight years to come to full functionality all over the world, we'll see the roadmap of uh, VRAR also in the same direction. Mm -hmm. But 
what has happened is with facebook rebranding is meta and you know every other tech company you know now suddenly rediscovering metaverse so metaverse has got into everybody's share of the mind and everybody's wondering what the hell is metaverse and i can't imagine a better time to be in immersive technologies than now yes yeah yes absolutely and so so with that we're going to segue into the topic of discussion um you know, we've both been working in this field um i for the past year i've been working with many different companies and building partnerships um and looking at how this whole wraps together now what is a partnership consortium and how does it actually differ from a joint venture uh, that you would do with another company so let's revisit at uh, base zero when you start a business and you start dealing with external parties for some form of collaboration or some form of business activity mm -hmm. you have various options and this is whether you are you know looking at doing business nationally or internationally you could appoint somebody as an agent for you to sell or provide a service x you could going internationally maybe set up a representative office mm -hmm. going internationally or even domestically you could set up a joint venture and what that means is that you are collaborating with somebody and both potentially have equity partnership or yet another model could be that you are opening a full fledged company in another country x so in a sense what is happening is that you are fundamentally responsible and allocating certain part of your functionality in stru some structured manner to somebody else mm. on the other hand what is a consortium consortium is where couple of entities get together to achieve certain objectives now why do you why would you want to enter into a consortium in the first place see for one reason is that if you are a small entity then if you need scale then either you grow organically or you know you go down a route of collaborating with couple of people to form a consortium second is that if you have skill a but the market for whatever form and shape requires skill a plus b plus c plus d so how best do you get those skills you know so one of the ways to do it is to have a consortia and consortia means essentially some kind of an agreement with a group of people who are providing you those complementary skills so that you are able to meet the needs of the marketplace third you know reason is that for managing risk if you are taking on some activity you are carrying the risk and the reward all by yourself mm. but when you form a consortia you mitigate the risk to a certain extent but yes the downside also is that you mitigate the rewards also so depending on your priorities you would go down that particular path another one is that you see in taking any business activity you know there it can be fairly expensive at times mm -hmm. so how do you you know find a way in which you can share cost with everybody yes in the in the in the process also sharing the rewards so that could also be one of the drivers for you know forming a consortium now to come back to your basic question that how are the two frameworks different so let's go back to what i said earlier in the first case you are the sole entity and you are kind of offloading part of the responsibility for a certain return in a some structured manner whereas in the other case 
you are actually partnering with a group of people or entities for joint sharing of risk reward towards a certain object. So that essentially is the difference. Got it. Okay, fantastic. Now, one of the questions that I have is um, the concerning the IP um, and the ownership for solutions that are born out of, con of, of a consortium. What are some of the different considerations um, to, to really think about when in regards to the IP ownership? So you see your question, and if I were to take the context of XR, yeah. there's actually three different elements. One is in terms of intellectual property rights. Second is in regard to consortia. And the third is XR. And if you blend all of these three elements together, you get some very, very interesting perspectives. You know, when you look at IPR, then IPR comes down, you know, looking into patents, into trademarks, and looking at, um, uh, you see, now the question is that what part of IPR are we talking about? That's number one. Number two is that when you talk about consortia, then what happens is that the members of the consortia, some of them could already be having some IPR before entering into the consortia. Now, the stage two is that in the consortia, some IPR is generated. Stage three is post, you know, the consortia reaching a certain milestone, you know, some IPR, how will the IPR be used? Mm -hmm. Now, so the question comes in is that, you know, you got to, you know, take into account, and this is just some of the factors. And let me also revisit the point, third point, which was in regard to immersive technologies. And let me take you, you see, because we are now heading into a world, especially with the metaverse kind of coming on. And of course, everybody will debate about what is a metaverse, but let's kind of broadly agree that it is a combination of the real and the virtual world and includes all forms of realities. Mm -hmm. Now, moment you take that kind of a, or or there is some element of a virtual world which is involved into this now let's take for example that you know you are using you know the 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 branding and um, the logo of coke mm -hmm. now when you use it in the real world it has you know it is governed by the copyright but what happens when you use it in the metaverse what happens when you distort it in the metaverse Hmm. So, you know, when you blend it, look at the entire range of possibilities, it is a fabulous situation. <laughs> Needless to say that you need to have an agreement in place. Hmm. And the agreement also, and this gets linked also with a certain amount of what is going to be the governance framework, you know, and what yeah. that governance framework really, and what we are talking about is that we kind of, when we get together as a uh, in, a, in a partnership or in a consortium model, then the first thing is that we've got to identify that what is the value proposition for each of the members? Mm. What is the common objective that we are kind of looking at? And what kind of a structure it will be? And also remember that when we talk about IPR, IPR is a local country subject, which means that IPR laws in Australia are going to be different from IPR laws in Singapore are going to be different from IPR laws in um, US. Mm -hmm. So that kind of, you know, unless upfront we are kind of looking at that, first of all, before agreement signing, what is the status of IPR of each of the individuals? And if some of their IPR is going to be used, are we licensing the, you know, the consortia to use it? Number two is that you see what is going to be the governing framework in that situation. And also to move looking at into the IPR situation is that look at what geography are we going to be registering this? Mm. Which geography are we going to be using it? Mm -hmm. Of course, there is no harm in registering all over the world or wherever it is, but everything costs money, you know, and at the end of the day, you've got to look at the trade-off between, you know, and, and each country may have slightly different requirements, which means that are you going to be keep tailoring the application or the product for every country kind of a thing. So this is where, you know, when broadly when we look at the IPR kind of a thing, yes, to again to revisit that you first look at, you know, what are the elements, you know, whether it is 
patent or whether it's a copyright or whether it's a trademark what is the what do the partners have before how is it what is going to be the framework or distribution of value of that between the three partners who is going to be providing what kind of resources is there a kind of a balance uh, you know a framework to bother that so all of these things will come into play and the, and lastly is that you, when you blend it with immersive technology it leads to a whole big you know question mark over a lot of things mm-hmm. so it leads to say that i am only highlighting you know at a very very high level as to some of the points which need to be considered but you know two very very important things is that you need must 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 have an agreement in place before you kick off which kind of clearly specify and cover this number two is that you must must these are areas which do need specialized you know skills so you must you know consult some specialist you know ipr specialist in the country because you know your consortia where is it going to be registered you know where is the ipr going to be registered which country is it going to be you know used so all these factors will come into play and so they must concern this you know so these are some of the things that uh, I, i can talk i mean i can talk it for a lot more but i thought i just kind of summarize these you know yeah this is fantastic you actually answered my next question anyways <laughs> but i want to i want to kind of maybe ask like certain scenarios on how they get started like do i just say i want to start <laughs> and then i reach out to people what are what is usually the that um i, I guess like that starting point is it usually uh a, a project brief that comes around maybe it's a public sort of uh use case so, okay got it so the question that you are asking is that in what circumstances do we kind of you know kick start a consortium correct yes and, and what is the driver so very often you see consortias are formed for uh, you know you know typically i'm giving you typical in, in large industries infrastructure projects cross consortias are very common because they tend to be multi billion dollar multi million dollar projects you know Mm-hmm. and they've got different stakeholders who are specialized in different things and the customer is looking for one single point of contact for um you know dealing yes. or looking for a complete turnkey situation solution the second is that you know very often in research organizations very often you have consortiums because then they are looking at a project based certain outcome and looking at certain complementary skills and certain framework because the organization which is funding it may invite a rfp or rft or something like that and that may require that you have certain consortia and just to give you an example that if i am looking at you see the based in australia and i am looking at you know doing something let's say a research project in singapore mm-hmm. now i have a couple of options that i can you know like i said i can open my own office i can operate from here i can have maybe a potential joint venture or something like that but at the end of the day the singapore entity which is funding the research project will want to deal with somebody based in singapore mm-hmm. and and they may require uh, skills x y z or certain kind of you know requirements which i am unable to meet myself which means that i have to form a consortia and i can take many different routes to do that that's another one mm-hmm. the third is very often for grants when it comes to grants you know typically the requirement you know there will be a selection criteria for the grant and for meeting the selection criteria it may be worthwhile to form a consortium now here again it is very important to look at you know what are the models of a consortium a consortium can be you know in one way where one of the partners can become a prime mm-hmm. by prime means they become the single point of contact in so far as the customer is concerned and everybody else becomes you know like a subcontract to them now another model can be where one partner is not prime they but they're just the representative of the entity vis-a-vis the customer mm-hmm. the third model can be where you know there is somebody from outside 
you know, the, the group of uh, people who are forming the consortia, they are front-ending it. And of course, there is a, you know, agreement with them, with the consortia. Now, the fourth element is that, you know, you can uh, have a different structure altogether. You can have a different vehicle altogether. You can form a new entity, which is the really the entity which is going to you know bid for it. Now, all of these have pros and cons, and depending on the size of the project, you know, depending on the nature of the project, you know, you will have your selection criteria. Also, when you go into all of this, you know, you also you have to look at a, a gated approach in terms of a uh, you know, profile of an activity or a project, you know, mm -hmm. because the initial phase can be of a feasibility study, you know, which can you know, be followed on to scoping, which can go on to design, development, implementation, and each of these stages, you can have go, no go decisions. You know. mm. Now, it is possible that you may have one structure at one particular phase, and you have another structure at another particular phase, you know, depending on what are the resource requirements. Now, who's pulling in what you know because is it a capital uh, resource is it a you know a skills resource or uh, is it some you know hardware which is required so all of these factors will come into play into looking at you know first of all you know that what structure and of course you know that should we have this consortia for a particular project or for ongoing activity or for multiple projects so all of these factors will come into play Wow, that's a lot to, to, to factor in and to, and to make these decisions. Um, let's say you've already had, you know, maybe maybe there's a grant application that you want to go for. Um, let's say you, you, you know what capabilities you have and you've identified different gaps. What would be, I guess, the best process for securing another like partner to come into the consortium. What are those best practices on finding people to work with? So this is a very good question because you see, I see this happening all the time. And what happens is that, you know, oh, there is the end date, you know, for submitting a grant application. And, you know, there are gaps in my application. Oh man, who's the first person that I know? <laughs> and I just talk to him and get together some agreement and, you know, get on with it. But I think that is the single most uh, step for which is going to take you to a failure, you know, because mm -hmm. you've got to remember that an agreement is as good as an agreement, you know, as the trust between the consortia partners. Mm -hmm. So... You know, the paramount is that, uh, you see, because very often, let's say hypothetically that, you know, we have to, grant, you know, um, there are gaps in submitting application uh, for a grant. Now, first question is that, is it in the same geographical location or is it international? Let's mm -hmm. say that I'm based in Australia and then I have to submit a grant in Singapore. Now, when it comes to that kind of a situation, then I have my first focus has to be looking at what is the key selection criteria from the customer. Mm. They will very often, you see, because uh, a Singapore government, like all governments all over the world, or for that matter, whether it's Australian government, will essentially provide funding for entities which are incorporated and based in Singapore. Yeah. They are not there to you know fund activities by Tom, Dick, and Harry all over the world. So what that means is that I need, first of all, you know, to have some kind of an agreement with somebody located in Singapore. Now, you see, in, in Middle East, you see, once upon a time, that used to be the only way that you could do business, is that the local partner had the way, you know, it was the front end and you had to be the back end for the, you know, the, the local company. Nowadays, things are much different. But the reality is that just imagine that you don't want to get stuck in a situation where the front end, you know, kind of does whatever they want to do. And, and, and uh, you know, you are there fumbling and wondering, how do I go about it? So that's where I mentioned the element of trust. Now, the question is that 
if I have, that is one I say is maybe a mandatory requirement. So you can look at the selection criteria and look at what are the mandatory requirements and what are what I call as you know flexible requirements from a selection process. The other is that if I need, let's say that I have skills in XR and this requires maybe you know some knowledge of uh, IOTs, maybe requires some knowledge of 5G, you know, I have some knowledge, but I'm not an expert in those areas. Mm -hmm. Therefore, essentially, I need to get partners into a consortia to get this together. Now, should I go for a consortia? Should I go for a partnership agreement? Now, remember that consortia essentially isn't also an expensive game because there is some money involved in, you know, finding your agreements and all this and you're operating in other country. So those are some of the decision points, but how would I go about finding? So the question number one is that, yes, I find the three things which come straight to my mind. One is that, okay, I need somebody who's going to be my representative, you know, for the customer located in Singapore. Second is that I've got somebody, I need somebody who's got IoT skills. Third is I need somebody who's got say uh, 5G skills. Now, do I get these people from Australia or do I, uh, you know, source them locally? And therein comes the question in terms of what is my strength of relationship with any of these people, you know, that I'm dealing with. How am I able to really establish? So my recommendation is that you see, in broadly, you know, we should be having a strategic outlook and be on the lookout and have working relationships, you know, with a range of people where you can judge in terms of what is the trust factor, what is the commonality of you know, the value proposition and the objective. Mm -hmm. So I may want the grant very, very, you know, I'm. this is the only objective in life. Whereas my partner, for him, it is just one of the hundred different things that he is doing. So will mm -hmm. I be able to get the share of that activity? See, finding a people, a range of people in the skill category is not difficult at all. But it is the question of the selection of the right, you know, mix, which is going to descend ultimately because it is a journey, mm -hmm. you know, and down the road, equations may may not change. You know? hmm. So therefore, if there is a working relationship, that you know, and the trust factor, that will be a long way. And you know, how do you? And end of the day, you have to align with whatever you know the selection criteria of uh, the grant or the funder is. All right. Well, Pradeep, thank you so much. You know, I trusted that you would bring the goods and you did. That was such an informative and actionable session. And your talk was truly amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Casey. I always enjoy uh, fireside chats with you, whether they are on uh, a platform like this or otherwise. So yes. once again, this is Pradeep from Sydney signing off and have a morning, good morning, tea, afternoon, lunch, evening, glass of wine or whatever it is in your part of the day and bye for now. Excellent. All right. And everybody, we are going to be taking a, what was it, an hour and a half break. So if you want to mix and mingle in the social lounge or jump on a table and chat with anybody, Please do so. Otherwise, we'll see you back here in 91 minutes. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Bye.